Let's take a look at this week's discussion questions. One from Lady Elliot's life. How would you describe that society's ideal of a woman's life? Two, how would you describe the society's standards of beauty? What makes a person handsome? And at this time, handsome could refer to men and women. Three, why do you think Lady Russell disapproves of Mrs. Clay? Mr. Shepherd's daughter. Do you agree? Why or why not? Question four, how would you describe that society's understanding of health? Do they think it's important? Why or why not? Five, how would you describe Elizabeth, Lady Russell, and Anne? Okay. So let's begin with the first one, Lady Elliot's life on page four. Uh, page four, there we go. Page four is actually the second page of our handout. The second page of the computer file, and because there are two pages for every page, paper page on the paper handout, this is on the first page of the handout. Um, so it says that vanity was the beginning and the end of Sir Walter Elliot's character, his personality, so he only cares about himself. Vanity of person and of situation. He cares about his own person and his own situation in life. Here that means the fact that he is a baronet, that he can call himself Sir Walter. Um, his good looks and his rank, uh, the fact that he is a baronet, had one fair claim on his attachment. Since to them he must have owed a wife of very superior character to anything deserved by his own. So this sentence means if we really look at it, his good looks and his noble uh, position really only gave him one. Or sorry, uh, really was only uh, rivaled by one other claim on his attachment. So only one other thing could draw his attention away from his good looks and his noble rank. And that is his wife. Oh, oh, here means own. So has, he has a wife, or rather had a wife, a very superior character. Superior means better than, and two here means then. So uh, the character of his wife is much better than what he himself deserves. So in other words, his wife is a better person than he is. Lady Elliot had been an excellent woman, sensible and amiable. Amiable means friendly. Whose judgment and conduct or behavior, if they might be pardoned the youthful infatuation which made her Lady Elliot, had never required indulgence afterwards. So this sentence means that her judgment and conduct were perfect except for the one time that she became infatuated or fell in love. But that time is OK, because that's exactly why she became Lady Elliot, why she got married to Sir Walter. Uh, but this infatuation never required indulgence afterwards. So aside from falling in love with Sir Walter and marrying him, everything else about her life was as a perfect lady. She had humored or softened or concealed his failings. 
uh, hum humor here means to to uh, tolerate with a kind heart. So when we say tolerate, we usually mean that in a negative way, right? Rong ren, right? Ren. But to humor means with a light heart, cheerily, happily, tolerate. Rong na, I guess. Uh, his or soften, which means to like to uh, make better, like make less worse. Make less bad. Or concealed to hide his failings and promoted his real respectability for 17 years. And though not the very happiest being in the world herself, so even though she herself was not very happy, had found enough in her duties as a wife, her friends and her children to attach her to life and to make it no matter of indifference to her when she was called on to quit them. To quit means to leave. So she was so attached to her duties, her friends and her children that when she had to leave them, when she died, it was no matter of indifference. She was not indifferent. Indifferent means le mu. So she cared. She did care about them uh, when she had to die. And that's all that we have in this entire novel about Lady Elliot. The perfect woman, except that she fell in love and married a man. And though she's not herself very happy, she still loved the people and duties in her life enough so that she didn't really want to die. So question one, how would you describe that society's ideal of a woman's life? Remember, Lady Elliot is here considered the perfect wife, the perfect woman. How is that judged? She is sensible and amiable doesn't do crazy things except for marrying a man, which is accepted because women are supposed to marry. She does her duties. She loves her friends and loves her children. She doesn't. She's not exactly happy, but she doesn't want to die either. So it seems like the ideal woman in that society is a woman who lives for other people for her husband, for her friends, for her family, her children. But whether she herself is happy or not is not important to that society. She is supposed to have a good character, which means she's always in control of herself. Uh, and the only possible exception is when she falls in love with a man and gets married. So we can describe it as a very patriarchal society. That's the first question. Do you want to ask me about it? Do you have questions about this one? OK, let's move to question two. Standards of beauty. Handsome. OK, well. The good news is we're using a PDF so we can <laughs> search for it. Uh, so the first time we see the word handsome describing a person, it is Sir Walter. He had been remarkably handsome in his youth. And at 54 was still a very fine man. OK. But notice that this part is from the perspective of Sir Walter here. He considered the blessing of beauty as inferior only to the blessing of a baronetcy. I guess baronetcy. And the Sir Walter Elliot himself, who united these gifts, so he's both beautiful and has a rank, 
was the constant object of his warmest respect and devotion. So he always thought of himself with respect and devotion because he is handsome and he has a rank. So the way that this is written, this is from his perspective. So when it says that he had been remarkably handsome and was still very fine, he's thinking about himself. And he says that beauty is only less important than rank. Rank is the only thing more important than beauty. So these two are connected, beauty and rank. Uh, beauty and nobility. Uh, let's look at the next instance. Elizabeth. Elizabeth is Sir Walter Elliot's oldest daughter. Uh, had succeeded at 16 to all that was possible of her mother's rights and consequence. So a mother's rights here means the rights of the wife or mistress of the house. So everything that a mother or the lady of the house can do and should do, Elizabeth does well. Elizabeth also succeeds to her mother's consequence. Consequence here means importance in society. So Elizabeth behaves in society in a way that gives her importance just like her mother did. So here succeed does not mean to win. Succeed means to inherit. So Elizabeth turns out to be a pretty good mistress of the house. Mistress is the female version of master. So a man is a master, a woman is a mistress. And being very handsome and very like himself. This himself is Sir Walter, so we're still talking about this from the perspective of Sir Walter. So Sir Walter thinks that Elizabeth is very handsome and very like himself. Therefore, her influence had always been great and they had gone on together most happily. So Sir Walter gets along very well with his oldest daughter Elizabeth because she is handsome and like himself. So when he favors Elizabeth, he's still favoring himself. So why does he call her handsome? OK, yes, maybe she is beautiful, but the judgment of that beauty is she is like him. And this is dependent on the rank that they have of being baronet. We have another example. Handsome. Ah, there we go. This is on page five still. Same page. It sometimes happens that a woman is handsomer at 29 than she was 10 years before. And generally speaking, if there has been neither ill health nor anxiety, it is a time of life at which scarcely any charm is lost. It was so with Elizabeth. Still the same handsome Miss Elliot that she had begun to be 13 years ago. Ah, uh, let's skip a bit. Elizabeth was blooming as ever amidst the wreck of the good looks of everybody else. So everybody else has started to look worse and worse. For Sir Walter could plainly see how old all the rest of his family and acquaintance were growing. Anne Haggard, Pilong. Mary Coarse, Tsuguang. Every face in the neighborhood worsting, which means worsening. And the rapid increase of the crow's foot about Lady Russell's temples. Temples is Taiyang Shu. A crow's foot is the wrinkles at the edge of the eyes. So the 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 outside edge of the eyes, the skin there becomes wrinkled. That's called a crow's foot. Uya jiao. So to Sir Walter, everybody is growing older and less beautiful, except for Elizabeth. 
uh, firstly, because Elizabeth is the most like himself, but secondly, because she had neither ill health nor anxiety. So to come back to our question, standards of beauty. First, connected with the situation in life. And second, healthy. Uh, healthy in body and in mind, right? So no anxiety, healthy body, healthy mind. Uh, so that seems to be how this society looks at beauty. We'll actually come back to this question a little bit later today. But for now, do you want to ask me about this one? OK, let's move on to question three. Lady Russell disapproves of Mrs. Clay, Mr. Shepherd's daughter. Why and do you agree? So page 11 and 12. Here. This is page 11. Elizabeth had been lately forming an intimacy which she wished to see interrupted. It was with a daughter of Mr. Shepherd who had returned after an unprosperous marriage to her father's house with the additional burden of two children. So uh, Mr. Shepherd's daughter used to be married, but it did not turn out well. It was unprosperous, uh, which means either that they divorced or her husband died and didn't leave her much money. Anyways, now she's back living with her father with the additional burden. Notice how the word burden is spelled. This is the older spelling in British English. Burden, fu dan, bao fu of two children. She was a clever young woman who understood the art of pleasing. She knew how to please people. The art of pleasing, at least at Kellynch Hall, which is where Sir Walter lives. And who had made herself so acceptable to Miss Elliot. This is Elizabeth, the unmarried Elliot daughter, Miss Elliot as to have been already staying there more than once in spite of all that Lady Russell, who thought it a friendship quite out of place, could hint of caution and reserve. So this is the first point that, or I guess two points. Let's say three points. First, she, uh, Mrs. Clay has left an unprosperous marriage. I think her husband died because if they divorced, she wouldn't be called Mrs. Clay. So her husband died, but it was not a very good marriage. That's the first point. The second point is now she has two children that she's raising by herself. And third, she seems to be very good at pleasing people in Sir Walter Elliot's home. Uh, I guess like in one way you can say this is good, right? She makes people happy. But in another way, this is simply to say that she is a flatterer, a panderer. Not a good thing. Uh, so Lady Russell thinks that it is the friendship between Mrs. Clay and Elizabeth is a friendship quite out of place. It doesn't belong. It's not a fitting friendship. Uh, but there's another point later on as well. Same page. Uh, in Lady Russell's estimate, Mrs. Clay was a very unequal. Uh, it was a very unequal, so she doesn't. Again, it's not a fitting friendship. The two sides don't match. And in her character, her personality, she believed a very dangerous companion. Mrs. Clay could be dangerous. Why would that be the case? Why would Mrs. Clay be a dangerous companion? Uh, well, I think mostly because 
Mrs. Clay is good at pleasing people, and therefore she can have some influence with people. When you know how to please someone, you can make them more willing to listen to you. And it seems like Lady Russell doesn't trust Mrs. Clay's advice. Probably because the character is so unequal. She comes from a non noble family, married poorly, and now has to raise two children as a single mother. This life experience is so far from the life experience of the Elliot household who are nobles and uh, who had once the perfect mother. Uh, and now Elizabeth, the oldest daughter, seems to be a worthy new lady of the house. So it seems like the life experience and the background is so different that Lady Russell doesn't trust Mrs. Clay. So the question here is, do you agree? Well, today when we think about this kind of question, usually we say, oh, you know, people of course think about things differently. Everybody comes from a different background, but that doesn't mean that they're bad people. We should still give everyone a chance, right? Everybody's equal. But the problem here is in that society, we'll, we're going to learn that it's in 1814 in England. It's not a democracy. People are not equal. You have common people and then you have nobles who have royal blood. Uh, and here Mrs. Clay is a commoner and not a noble, whereas Sir Walter Elliot is a noble because he is he has a baronetcy and he's called Sir. So no, they're not in the, in this society. These two people are not equal. Uh, Elizabeth Elliot and Mrs. Clay are not equal. So there's no reason that Lady Russell should give Mrs. Clay the benefit of the doubt. There's no reason that she has to give her a chance to trust her at the beginning. Moreover, the art of pleasing is usually an art used by servants and lower people because they don't want to make their bosses angry. Today, of course, everybody has to work for somebody, so the art of pleasing is simply a good life skill. But in that society, nobles didn't have to please everybody in their life. They only had to please the more important nobles. So knowing the art of pleasing, being good at pleasing people, means that there are more people in your life that are more important than you, than less important than you. So you are among the lower class. Uh, so again, this is another reason why Lady Russell doesn't trust Mrs. Clay. She's a common person. Uh, again, personally, like if we look at these people as individual people, it doesn't make sense. But if you think about this from the perspective of society, the idea that individual people are always influenced by the society around them. Uh, their values come from their families and their society and their culture. So if the society says it's not a good idea to trust people from a different class, then to these characters, this is the right way to think. They would think that it's not right to automatically trust people from a different class. And so the fact that Mrs. Clay in that society is trying to please people of a higher class, is staying at their house, is forming a friendship with a noble's daughter itself is a sign that she is not a very good person because in this society they have that value to separate the classes. But Mrs. Clay is not following that value. So simply in that behavior and the idea that she doesn't follow the values of her society, it's probably a good idea not to trust her very much. Uh, and by the way, the art of pleasing. The word art here does not mean issue. The word art here means skill. 
So she's very skillful. She's very good at pleasing people. OK, do you have a question about number three? OK, let's look at number four. Understanding of health 14 and 15. Do they think it's important? Why or why not? OK. And 15. So here they are talking about possible candidates to rent out Kellynch Hall. Uh, and the person who's saying all these words is Sir Walter himself. And he's saying that uh, he's against any of his friends joining the Navy hydrant. And it is in two points offensive to me. First, uh, I have two strong grounds of objection to it. A ground is a reason. So he has two strong reasons to object to any of his friends or family joining the Navy. First, as being the means of bringing persons of obscure birth into undue distinction and raising men to honors which their fathers and grandfathers never dreamt of. In other words, it makes it can make common people more important. And this is, of course, when a common sailor wins a battle or is honored for his military performance, maybe even knighted, right? Fengzhi, and suddenly becomes a noble. It raises men to honors which their fathers and grandfathers never dreamt of. Because usually, Nobility and honor is passed down father to son. So Sir Walter Elliot, if he had a son, his son would be the next Sir Walter or the next Sir, whatever his name. Uh, but here, because it, when someone, a common person joins the Navy and wins glory and honor, they may ra rise higher than their fathers and grandfathers. And so to Sir Walter, this is unnatural and this is a bad thing. Notice honors is spelled in the British way. American English, there's no U. The second reason. It cuts up a man's youth and vigor. Vigor means energy. Most horribly. A sailor grows old sooner than any other man. I have observed it all my life. So this has to do with health, right? It ages somebody. Again, notice how health is not mentioned alone. It is mentioned with something else. And again, that something else is rank. Rank and health are considered together. Apparently, the higher rank that you deserve, not that you have, because these sailors don't deserve their rank, according to Sir Walter, but the higher rank you deserve, the younger you look or the healthier you look. There's a second point, right? I said page 14 to 15. So on page 15. After Sir Walter get, tells a long story about meeting a sailor who is only 40 but looks 62. Mrs Clay responds, this is page 15. Nay, Sir Walter, which means no, I disagree. Cried Mrs Clay. To cry does not mean to weep, you know, doesn't mean cool. To cry means to shout. But even it doesn't even mean to shout. It, it means to shout today, but in the past it didn't mean to shout. It just means to say with energy. Uh, so nay, Sir Walter, Miss, Mrs. Clay replied with energy. This is being severe indeed. Have a little mercy on the poor men. We are not all born to be handsome. Aha, beauty. The sea is no beautifier, certainly. Sailors do grow old betimes. Betimes means uh, after a time, after a while. I have often observed it. They soon lose the look of their youth. But then is not it the same with many other professions? Perhaps most other. 
soldiers in active service are not at all better off. And even in the quieter professions, there is a toil and a labor of the mind. Toil means work. Labor also means work. If not of the body, which seldom leaves a man's looks to the natural effect of time. So let's pause here. What is she saying? She's saying, yes, sailors do grow old very quickly, but in many other professions, perhaps most other professions, people also grow older quickly. Soldiers like sailors, same thing, same thing, but even in the quieter professions where you use your mind to work, it also uh, makes people look older. So she's giving a new idea, right? She said no to Sir Walter. She's disagreeing. But even as she begins to disagree, she first agrees. The seed does not help one's beauty, certainly. This is agreeing. Sailors do grow old in time. This is agreeing. So remember, she's good at pleasing people. This is one example. Even when she disagrees, she first agrees to make the other person feel like, yes, they did say the right thing. But then she says people who use their mind to work also grow older, and then she gives some examples. The lawyer plods, quite careworn. Care means uh, worry. So a lawyer worries about many things and it wears him down. The physician or the doctor is up at all hours and traveling in all weather. Back then, you didn't go to see the doctor. The doctor came to see you, so they had to travel around all the time. And even the clergyman, so this is someone who works in the church. She stopped a moment to consider what might do for the clergyman. Ah, this tells us she didn't plan this speech. She's thinking as she talks. And here she's thinking, OK, clergyman, good example. But why? what would they do? Why might they feel tired also? My, why might they grow older quickly? And this is what she thinks of. And even the clergyman, you know, is obliged to go into infected rooms and expose his health and looks to all the injury of a poisonous atmosphere. Uh, OK, why does the clergyman have to go into infected rooms? And enter a poisonous atmosphere? Well, because one of the main jobs of a pastor or a curate or someone who works in the church is to give people a good death to make sure that before someone dies, they have confessed all their sins and have reaffirmed their faith in God. And therefore, when they die, they will go to heaven. And as many people die from sickness, therefore the clergyman will have to come into contact with many sick and dying people. And according to Mrs. Clay, this also will make him grow old faster. She continues. In fact, as I have long been convinced, though every profession is necessary and honorable in its turn, it is only the lot of those who are not obliged to follow any, who can live in a regular way in the country, choosing their own hours, following their own pursuits, and living on their own property without the torment of trying for more. Torment means suffering. It is only their lot. I say lot here means destiny. It is only their destiny, I say, to hold the blessings of health and a good appearance to the utmost. I know no other set of men, but what lose something of their personableness when they cease to be quite young. Personableness means here good appearance. So what is she saying? Only people who do not have to follow any profession. Only people who don't have to work. And therefore they can keep regular hours in the country. 
their schedule is fixed. There's no sudden change in their schedule. They can choose their own schedule. They can do what they want. Follow their own pursuits means to do what they want. Live on their own land. They don't have to try for more. They don't have to work for money. They don't have to work for land. Only these people are healthy and beautiful. So she's basically talking about Sir Walter and his family, right? They're nobles. They don't have to work. So in a very roundabout way, Mrs. Clay is praising Sir Walter and his family for being healthy and beautiful. But along the way, it gives us another insight into how the society viewed health. As long as you work, whether it's physical work or mental work, you grow older faster. And the older you grow, the less beautiful you are. The only people who don't have to work are nobles. Therefore, question four, this society's understanding of health is that the more noble you are, the healthier you are. And so commoners are less healthy, nobles are more healthy. Do they think it's important? Yes, it's very important because as you can tell by now, the only thing that these people really care about is their status, their noble status, the fact that they are connected in some way to the royal family. And we can tell because whether it's beauty or health or marriage, the only thing they care about in these places, in these aspects, is the relation to status. Uh, only nobles are really healthy, only nobles are really beautiful, and you have to marry somebody who is also a noble. Of course, when I say that society, I'm not talking about all of England. We just mentioned that in that period, you would not put nobles and commoners together. You would think of them as two different societies. So when I say that society, I'm talking about these noble people society, the society of the nobility. So in a way, it's not surprising that they would think the most important thing is that they're nobles. It's what separates them from the common people. So they, of course, would put a lot of importance on this point. OK, do you want to ask me about question four? OK, question five. How would you describe these three key women? Well, Elizabeth, we just looked at, right? And the novel says that she is exactly the same as her father. Uh, vain, I no, 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 Zilin, vain, and uh, cares a lot about their status. But the novel also said that she is a good mistress and a good uh, lady of the house. Because that is also connected with status. You not only had to have the title, you also had to behave in the right way. So everything for her goes back to status. And so if something is unrelated to status, uh, she would care less. So for example, uh, let's see if I can find it. For example, uh, when they have to start saving money, they have to retrench because Sir Walter owes too much money. Uh, one thing that Elizabeth proposes for saving money is to not bring Anne a present from their trip to London. Uh, let's see if I can find this. Oh, 
There we go. OK, this is on page eight. So they have to save money. And Elizabeth is trying to think of ways to save money. She afterwards added the happy thought, happy thought of their taking no present down to Anne from London as had been the usual yearly custom or tradition. Anne is her sister. Every year they bring her a present from London. But in order to save money, Elizabeth decides it's OK not to do this. What a very unkind and cruel sister. How much money, after all, can you save on one present? Uh, so that's also part of who Elizabeth is. She only cares about her status. Even not caring about her family if her family doesn't fit with the importance of status. What about Lady Russell? There we go. This is on page. Four. Uh, so. Uh, Lady Elliot. Elizabeth's mother had a close friend named Lady Russell, so a woman who was married to a guy named Sir Russell, uh, but Sir Russell died. And so Lady Russell is now a widow. Um, and so after Lady Elliot dies, she, uh, Lady Russell and Sir Walter did not marry, but they were still near neighbors and intimate friends. Lady Russell lives on Sir Walter's land. Uh, so just a quick description, Sir Walter owns the land of Kellynch. On that land is built his own home, Kellynch Hall, Da Tang. But uh, he also also owns the land around Kellynch Hall. So common villagers live on his land, and also Lady Russell lives on his land. So they're neighbors. Who is Lady Russell? Of steady age and character. So steady character, her personality is steady. And when so, OK, but what about steady age? Doesn't everybody grow old the same uh, at the same speed? Uh, well, here it means not the actual age, but the appearance of age. It looks like she doesn't grow old quickly. Like, uh, you know, when you live with someone a long time, you don't notice that they grow old, that kind of thing. Uh, and she is extremely well provided for, which means that her husband left her a lot of money. Um, let's see. Do we have another description of Lady Russell? Well, the idea is that Lady Russell is a clear sighted woman. She has a head on her shoulders. Uh, she has proper ideas of what to do and how to do it. Um, and she's a good friend to Sir Walter and also to Anne. And that brings us to the third part. How should we describe Anne? Here on page five, we have her our first description. She has an elegance of mind. Yo ya de I guess. So what does that mean? An elegance of mind? It, it's describing how she thinks. She thinks uh, about things in a very elegant way. So in a very proper, a very good and kind way. Whenever she considers a situation, she always tries to come up with the best outcome for everybody. That kind of idea. 
She also has a sweetness of character. Her personality is very sweet. Which means that she's always pleasing and always like kind. Uh, doesn't uh, display negative emotions, that kind of idea. And these two put together must have placed her high with any people of real understanding. So anybody who has a good head on their shoulders, anybody who knows what's important would think that Anne is a very good person, would place her high, would rank her very high among people that they value. But because her father is not someone with a good head on his shoulders and Elizabeth is just like her father. Therefore, at in her house, Anne's word had no weight. No matter what she said, nobody listened. Her convenience was always to give way. So whenever there's some kind of conflict, she always has to yield to another person. In her house, she was only Anne. But to Lady Russell, because Lady Russell does have a good head on her shoulders, Anne was a most dear and highly valued goddaughter, Zhao Nu. Uh, so in traditional forms of Christianity, when you are baptized, so she, you gain another pair of parents. Another uh, couple will agree to help your own parents to take care of you and to raise you and to guide you. And this other set of parents is called godparents. Uh, the most famous example today is there's a movie called The Godfather, Zhao Fu. That's where this comes from, or that's how most people understand this idea. Uh, so Lady Russell is Anne's godmother. She agreed to help Lady Russell take care of Anne. But also Anne is Lady Russell's favorite, someone that she enjoys being around, someone that she favors, and a friend. The word friend used to be a much more important word than today. Today, anybody you know is your friend. But in those days, a friend is someone that you know very well and that you trust. Everyone else that you simply just know, you're not friends, but you know them, is called an acquaintance. Uh, even today, some people will say, oh, we're not really friends. He's just an acquaintance, just somebody I know. Uh, so how would we describe Anne? She is kind, she is smart, and she is ignored. There's also something else we can say about her, which is that uh, she, Anne was once in love. Here. Uh, no, that's sorry, that's Elizabeth. Um, let's see. Frederick Wentworth. Let's see if I can find it. Um, yeah, this is the story. I'm on page 18. So seven years ago, Frederick Wentworth uh, moved in with his brother and his brother was living on Sir Walter's land. And so he, uh, Frederick and Anne met and they fell in love rapidly and deeply in love. So quickly and deeply. Uh, Anne received his declaration of love and his proposal of marriage. Uh, they were happy, but everybody in Anne's family opposed the marriage. First of all, because Frederick is a commoner, he's not a noble. So that's why her father opposed the marriage. But Lady Russell was also against the marriage. Uh, mainly because at the time. 
Frederick was a nobody. He had no money. He had no connections and he was joining the Navy, so he might die. At the time, England was fighting France in the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon and uh, So Lady Russell thought it was a bad idea. And Anne, who usually maybe would not listen to her father, listened to Lady Russell and broke off the engagement. And after that, she was sad for these past seven years. Now let's take a short break and we'll come back to look at this question more closely. So Frederick and Anne met. He proposed marriage. She accepted. They had a brief happy time together, right? A short period of exquisite felicity followed. So they had a brief happy time together. Felicity means happiness. Uh, but a short one. Trouble soon arose. Sir Walter on being applied to. So Frederick has to ask him for his his permission to marry his daughter. Without actually withholding his consent or saying it should never be, gave it all the negative of great astonishment, which here means shock, great coldness, great silence, and a professed resolution of doing nothing for his daughter. The footnote tells us that he would give her no dowry. He thought it a very degrading alliance. As we said, Frederick is not a noble. And Lady Russell, though with more tempered and pardon pardonable pride, uh, so not as arrogant, received the proposal as a most unfortunate one. So Lady Russell also disagrees with the marriage. Anne Elliot, according to Lady Russell, this is from her perspective, Anne Elliot, with all her claims of beauty, birth, and mind, to throw herself away at 19, involve herself at 19 in an engagement with a young man who had nothing but himself to recommend him, and no hopes of attaining affluence. Affluence means wealth. But in the chances of a most uncertain profession and no connections to secure even his farther rise in that profession. At this point, both his parents had died. So he doesn't have money. He doesn't have connections. Would be indeed a throwing away, which she grieved to think of. Anne Elliot, so young, known to so few, to be snatched off by a stranger without alliance or fortune, or rather sunk by him into a state of most wearing, anxious, youth-killing dependence. So what is she saying? Anne Elliot is still very young. She doesn't, she doesn't have to rush to get married. At this point, she is 20. Anne is known to so few, which really means she knows so few men. In other words, she basically only just met this Frederick guy. How does she know that this is really the man that she wants to stay with for the rest of their lives? Maybe there's a better man out there. To be snatched off by a stranger, a stranger. They don't know him. They don't know his family. He's not a noble. They can't trace any kind of connection. So he's a complete stranger. Without alliance or fortune. So he doesn't know anybody important. He doesn't have money. Or rather not snatched off by Drozel, but to be sunk by him into a state of dependence. Eli de Guanxi. And this state is very wearing, very anxious, youth killing. 
again, because Frederick is a sailor, he's away at sea most of the time. So this marriage would be full of anxiety. Long distance and also maybe he would die in battle. And so Lady Russell also opposes. Captain Wentworth had no fortune. He had been lucky in his profession, but spending freely what had come freely had realized nothing. So whatever money he makes easily, he spends also easily, and therefore he had saved up no money. To realize does not mean to discover. To realize means to create. To make real, right? Realize. In Chinese, this is Xian. But he was confident that he should soon be rich. Full of life and ardor, ardor means passion, Ruqing. He knew that he should soon have a ship and soon be on a station that would lead to everything he wanted. He had always been lucky. He knew he should be so still. He would still be lucky. So, OK, he knew that he would soon have a ship, but what does that have to do with money? Footnote six tells us. Uh, that he would with a ship, he would be able to capture many enemy vessels. And at that time, uh, capturing enemy ships and taking their money is how English sailors became rich. <clears throat> And this is one reason why uh, historically English sailors were known as pirates with a country. They basically just took their enemy stuff. So Frederick himself is not worried. Anne is convinced, but Lady Russell disagrees. Such opposition as these feelings produced was more than Anne could combat, so she can't fight against it. Young and gentle as she was, it might have been possible to withstand her father's ill will, though unsoftened by one kind word or look on the part of her sister. Uh, in other words, even if her sister Elizabeth did not help her, she may still have been able to defy her father. But Lady Russell, whom she had always loved and relied on, could not with such steadiness of opinion and such tenderness of manner be continually advising her in vain. So because Lady Russell is such a good person and because Anne has always loved and relied on her, the fact that Lady Russell is continually advising her means that this must have some effect. Therefore, she was persuaded to believe the engagement a wrong thing. There's the word persuaded. Remember, the name of this novel is persuasion. Uh, so the final exam will ask you about this word. She was persuaded that this engagement is wrong. But it was not a merely selfish caution under which she acted in putting an end to it. So she only agreed to break off the engagement, not because it would be good for herself, but also because it would be good for Frederick. Uh, principally for his advantage. This was her chief consolation, the idea that she is doing this not for herself, but for the man that she loves. Of course, he was did not take it so well. On his side, totally unconvinced and unbending. Unbending means he does not change his mind. And he feels himself ill used, so mistreated like uh, Anne had been playing with him. 
therefore he had left the country. A few months had seen the beginning and the end of their acquaintance, but not with a few months ended Anne's share of suffering from it. So Anne was heartbroken for a long time. Next page, page 20. Um, over these past seven years, she had been too dependent on time alone. No aid had been given in change of place or in any novelty or enlargement of society. So how does she deal with heartbreak? She simply lets time pass, but it doesn't work very well. First, because she stayed in the same place with the same memories, and she didn't enlarge her society, which means she didn't meet more people. Meeting more people, meeting new people can take your mind off heartbreak, but she didn't do that. Uh, there was no second attachment. There was one person who asked for her hand in marriage. She had been solicited, which means asked for. When about two and twenty, so this is two years after breaking off the engagement. To change her name by the young man. So this is a very interesting way to say this. She had been asked to change her name. How? By marrying him. If she marries a man, her name would change. And who is this young man who not long afterwards found a more willing mind in her younger sister? So this is the man who later married her younger sister, Mary Elliot, Charles Musgrove. Uh, but Anne refused him. So at this point in the story, seven years after heartbreak, she is still very sad. Not sad like crying every day, but the, the feeling is that uh, she has given up basically on the idea of marriage uh, because she is still heartbroken. So how could we describe Anne? Kind, smart, willing to please other people, ignored, and also heartbroken. OK, do you have questions about number five? OK, let's start from let's go back to the beginning of this week's reading and we'll take a closer look. Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall in Somersetshire. Somerset. The the word the ending sure. This just means county in Chinese dream. Uh, so the area of Somerset. Somerset is in the southwest of England. Was a man who for his own amusement, so to to prevent himself from being bored to it's something that he does to to be happy. Never took up any book but the baronetage. So the only book he read was this book, the baronetage and the footnote tells us it's probably this book. This book, uh, we will soon learn, is the record of all of the nobles in England. Everybody who has a title, everybody who is a noble, and it records details about each noble's family. This is the book that he reads for fun. It's the only book he reads. 
again obsessed with status. There he found occupation for an idle hour. Occupation means something to do. He occupies himself. He spends his time on this. For an idle hour, idle means with nothing to do. So when he has an hour of nothing to do, he picks up this book and reads. And it also gives him consolation in a distressed hour. So when he's feeling distressed, when he's feeling uh, down, he can read this book for consolation. There his faculties were roused into admiration and respect. Faculties here means emotions and uh, sensibilities, how he feels. Uh, and this book will make him feel admiration. And respect. By contemplating the limited remnant of the earliest patents. Here the footnote tells us patents means titles. Remnant means what is left. The idea is that there are fewer and fewer titles. There are fewer and fewer nobles. And if you think about it, this makes sense. If nobility is passed down from father to son, then whenever a family no longer has a new son, their title ends. That family's nobility ends. So it does make sense. Over time, there are fewer and fewer noble families. And by thinking about this fact, Sir Walter gains admiration and respect. The idea is admiration and respect for himself because he still has a title. Fewer and fewer people have titles, but he still has one. Uh, there, while he's reading the book, any unwelcome sensations, uh, feelings, unwelcome feelings arising from domestic affairs changed naturally into pity and contempt. So anything from his home, domestic affairs, uh, having to do with his home, that makes him feel negative feelings, changed into pity and contempt whenever he read the book. Pity and contempt again for the families that have ended, whose titles have not been continued. As he turned over the almost endless creations of the last century, a creation is when the king or queen makes someone a new noble and they have a new title and they can then begin passing down that title. So in the last century, there have been born many new, uh, created many new nobles. Um, as he turned over the almost endless creations of the last century, so as he flipped through the book. And there, if every other leaf or page were powerless, he could read his own history with an interest which never failed. So it, the above describes how reading this book makes him happy. But even if reading about all the other families did not make him happy, it, it was powerless. He could at least read his own history and this never failed to make him happy. This was the page at which the favorite volume always opened. Elliot of Kellynch Hall. Walter Elliot, born March 1, 1760, married July 15, 1784. So this is when he was married. Uh, this is when he was married. Notice that his wife's name is not recorded. 
Again, in a patriarchal society like this, when a woman marries, her name is changed to her husband's name. Uh, sorry, no, here. Uh, I was confused. Lady Elliot is Elizabeth, daughter of James Stevenson. So her original name was Elizabeth Stevenson. Esquire of South Park. Esquire is a title that means he has no title. It means he was a lawyer. He had the right to uh, practice law. And he came from a place called South Park in the county of Gloucester. This word is uh, pronounced as Gloucester. You can ignore the C. So uh, on this date, Walter Elliot married Elizabeth Stevenson, who was not a noble. By which lady who died 1800, he has issue. Issue means children. Elizabeth, the oldest child, born June 1st, 1785. And the second child, born August 9, 1787. A stillborn son, which means that this baby uh, died before he was born. And therefore he did not have a name. Um, at that time, babies were named only when they were baptized. So she does the whole. So if he's born dead, he's not baptized, doesn't have a name. November 5, 1789. And the youngest daughter, Mary, born November 20, 1791. So like when we look at this, it's a very dry and boring piece of writing. It's just names and dates and relationships. But reading this always makes Sir Walter happy. And so we can we can tell that he's not a man of culture, right? He doesn't enjoy literature. This is the only book he reads. So why does it make him happy? Because it reminds him. His name is in this book. He's a noble. He's important. That's what makes him happy. Precisely such, which means in this way had the paragraph originally stood from the printer's hands. So when the book was printed, this is what it said. But Sir Walter had improved it by adding for the information of himself and his family these words after the date of Mary's birth. Married December 16, 1810, Charles, son and heir of Charles Musgrove, Esquire, not a noble, of Uppercross in the county of Somerset. So uh, here he added it at the end. Now this is not part of the book because Charles is not a noble, so he doesn't belong in the book. But apparently Sir Walter thinks that his daughters are so important that even when his daughter marries someone who's not a noble, that person belongs in the book. And the other thing he changes is he inserts most accurately the day of the month on which he had lost his wife. Right, because the book simply says who died 1800, so he adds the month and the day. Um, Pretty sure it's not because he thinks it's a good thing that his wife died, but merely because he's such an important person, he thinks that every single detail has to be recorded accurately and faithfully in this very important book. Remember, vanity, status. Then followed, so after this, the history and rise of the ancient and respectable family in the usual terms. So after recording the current situation of his family, 
the book gives the history of the Elliot family. Uh, I'm going to skip this part because it's as boring as that first part of the book. But basically, it's the brief history of his family. Concluding with the arms and motto. Uh, the arms is the coat of arms, the the emblem, the picture that represents this noble family. Uh, in Chinese, this is Hui uh, Zhang and motto. Now, again, this is an older use of English. This colon, Mao Hao. Today, we use a colon to say, now I'm going to explain. So after reading that there are arms and motto, we would expect the following to be his family's motto, Biao Yu. But no, because in traditional British English, the colon is not to explain. The colon is a long pause. It's not logic, it's rhetoric. As is showed, it affects how you read, not the meaning of what you read, but how you read. Uh, in fact, there are four kinds of pauses in traditional British English. Uh, to tell you how long you should wait before continuing to read the sentence. And the four kinds of pauses in order of longest pause to shortest pause is the period, the colon, the semicolon, and then the comma. So in traditional British English grammar, the period does not necessarily mean this is the end of the sentence. It always means this is where you should pause the longest time. Uh, so the colon is not an explanation. It is tells you to pause. And after the arms and motto, it says the book says principal seat. So this is where they live, the, their main home. Principal seat, Kellynch Hall in the county of Somerset. And this is the end of their family history, but Sir Walter's handwritten writing again in this finale. Finale means ending. So after the end, he also writes a new ending. Heir presumptive. Heir is Ji Ren. Presumptive means in guide, li lun sang de. Uh, and we're going to talk about why a bit later. Who is the presumed heir? William Walter Elliot Esquire. Great grandson of the second Sir Walter. So it looks like in this family, every son, every first son is named Walter. That's why they say the first Sir Walter, the second Sir Walter, that kind of thing. Um, so this dude, William Walter Elliot Esquire, is not a noble because it, it says his name is Esquire. Only when he becomes the heir, when he does inherit Kellynch Hall, would he also inherit the title of Sir. But right now he's not the heir. He's the heir presumptive. He should be the heir. And the reason is because he is not Sir Walter's son. He only becomes the heir if Sir Walter dies without a son. But if Sir Walter remarries and has a son, this William guy would not become the heir. The heir would be Sir Walter's son. Um, so again, he doesn't belong in this book. He's not a noble. He's not an heir, but Sir Walter again believes his family and himself to be so important that even this minor detail has to be noted in the book. OK, we talked about the next paragraph. Uh, was still a very fine man. He still thinks that he's quite handsome. 
few women could think more of their personal appearance than he did. The idea here is that there are few women who think that they themselves are so beautiful as Sir Walter thinks that he himself is so beautiful. So he cares more about his personal appearance than most women. Nor could the valet of any new maid lord be more delighted with the place he held in society. A valet is a servant, the main servant. So this is making another comparison. Imagine how happy a servant must be when his master becomes a noble, a new made lord. Compared to this servant, Sir Walter himself is even happier with his own status. Uh, right, next paragraph. Lady Elliot, we also talked about this. Um, right, Lady Elliot dies. She leaves behind three girls. The two eldest, 16 and 14, and this was an awful legacy. Legacy means something that you leave behind after you die. This was an awful legacy for a mother to bequeath. To bequeath means to leave behind after you die. So after you die, you bequeath a legacy. So uh, the novel is saying that it's a terrible thing for Lady Elliot to have left behind two daughters after she died. It is an awful charge. Charge means responsibility. To confide to the authority and guidance of a conceited, silly father. So why is this a terrible legacy? Why is it an awful responsibility? Because their father, Sir Walter, is conceited, which means too proud of himself, and silly, which means he doesn't have a good head on his shoulders. He doesn't think about situations clearly. So to leave two young women, you two young girls, 16 and 14, to the care of this silly, conceited man, to the authority and guidance of Sir Walter is a terrible idea. She, Lady Elliot, had, however, one very intimate friend, a sensible, deserving woman, uh, who had been brought by strong attachment to herself, to Lady Elliot, to settle close by her in the village of Kellynch. So not Kellynch Hall, but the village of Kellynch, the land that Sir Walter owns. And on her kindness and advice, Lady Elliot mainly relied for the best help and maintenance of the good principles and instruction which she had been anxiously giving her daughters. So because Lady Elliot could not depend on her husband to give a proper upbringing and education to their children. She depended on. This turns out to be Lady Russell, her friend. So you can say that Lady Russell is already, even if she's not a godmother, she's a godmother, but even aside from that, Lady Russell helped a lot in raising Elizabeth and Anne. Uh, right. Uh, we skipped when we were talking about Lady Russell, we skipped this part. Lady Russell had no thought of a second marriage. This needs no apology to the public in or in other words to the reader. Because the public is rather apt to be unreasonably discontented when a woman does marry again than when she does not. So here the novel is saying people of this time thought that a, a widow should not remarry. 
but Sir Walter's continuing in singleness requires explanation. However, the same society expects widowers, guanfu, to remarry. Therefore, the novel is going to explain why Sir Walter is still single. Be it known then, which means I'm going to tell you now, that Sir Walter, like a good father, having met with one or two private disappointments and very unreasonable applications, prided himself on remaining single for his dear daughter's sake. So he says that he does not remarry so that he can take care of his daughter. But really, the reason is given us in parentheses. He met with one or two private disappointments in very unreasonable applications. If you remember, apply here means to ask for the hand in marriage. So what this says is he tried once or twice to propose to a lady, but these proposals were very unreasonable. Most probably because he was proposing to a higher ranked noble. Right, he thinks he's very important, so of course he would try to marry someone even more important than he is. And therefore he met with disappointment. These women turned him down, rejected him. But they were private. Uh, they were not well known to most people. This also tells us that he did not spend a lot of time pursuing these women. Because if he, he's a noble, he spends a lot of time in society. If in society he tries to pursue these women, people would see and they would know what's going on. So the fact that it's a private disappointment means that he probably didn't try very hard. And therefore he's now single and he tells people that this is for his daughter's sake. Notice. One daughter, singular, Dan Shu. For one daughter, his eldest, Elizabeth, he would really have given up anything which he had not been very much tempted to do. So this means he would have given up anything for Elizabeth if she had asked him. But he had not been very tempted to do this, which means that she had not asked him to give up many things. So just like when he says he's staying single for his daughter, this idea he would give up anything is just something that he says. The idea has never been tested. Uh, Elizabeth, we talked about this part. His two other children were of very inferior value. So compared to Elizabeth, he doesn't like uh, Anne or Mary very much. Mary had acquired a little artificial importance. So she gained a little status, but it's not a good status. It's not a pure status. It's artificial. Uh, like forced. By becoming Mrs. Charles Musgrove. This is the man that Anne rejected. Uh, this idea of calling a wife by her husband's name, right? So here it doesn't say Mrs. Mary Musgrove. It says Mrs. Charles Musgrove. This is still used today, uh, usually in marriage. After the at the end of the wedding ceremony, the priest will say, I now pronounce you Mr. and Mrs. Charles Musgrove, which means they're married. Uh, but aside from that, this is usually not seen very often anymore today. So Mary at least had tried to gain some status. She didn't do very well, but she tried. But Anne, with an elegance of mind and sweetness of character, we talked about this, was only Anne did not marry, uh, has no status, her father doesn't care about her. Uh, Lady Russell likes Anne very much. Lady Russell loved them all, 
but it was only in Anne that she could fancy or imagine the mother to revive again. So this sentence means that out of all three daughters, Lady Russell thinks that it is Anne who is most like Lady Elliot. And remember, Lady Elliot is the perfect woman. So Lady Russell is here basically calling Anne the perfect woman. A few years before, Anne Elliot had been a very pretty girl, but her bloom had vanished early. And as even in its height, her father had found little to admire in her. So even when Anne was most beautiful, her father did not think her very pretty. So totally different were her delicate features and mild dark eyes from his own. And the reason he did not think Anne was pretty is because they, uh, she looked so totally different from him. Remember, he likes Elizabeth because Elizabeth is like him. So when Anne is unlike him, he doesn't like her. So what does Anne look like? She has delicate features. And mild dark eyes. So her eyes are dark, but not fierce, not strong. They are kind, dark eyes. So when she was most beautiful, her father did not think her beautiful. Therefore, there could be nothing in her appearance now that she was faded and thin to excite his esteem. Therefore, even less does he think of her now. He had never indulged much hope. He had now none of ever reading her name in any other page of his favorite work. So he never really thought that Anne would marry a noble. And now that she is 27 and still single and no longer very pretty, as he thinks, uh, he has no hope that she would marry a noble. Therefore, all equality of alliance, marrying a noble, must rest with Elizabeth. For Mary had merely connected herself with an old country family of respectability and large fortune, but not a noble, and had therefore given all the honor and received none. Think about this. Mary is the child of a noble. She marries a man who is rich and good and respectable, but simply because Charles Musgrove is not a noble, therefore Sir Walter Elliot thinks that Mary has given the honor and received none. Not received little, received no honor. That's how highly he thinks of his status. So Anne probably won't get married well. Mary married a commoner. Therefore, Walter Elliot relies on Elizabeth to one day marry suitably. But remember, she's already 29. Right? She's already 29 years old. Uh, so in the society of that time, she's already growing old as a single lady. Uh, Elizabeth did not quite equal her father in personal contentment. She's not as happy as her father. Thirteen years had seen her mistress or lady master of Kellynch Hall pres uh, presiding and directing, so doing what a, what a lady of the house must do with a self-possession and decision which could never have given the idea of her being younger than she was. So the idea here is that she always behaved as the mistress of the house older than she was. She acted older than she actually was. Remember, she became mistress of the house at 16. For 13 years had she been doing the honors and laying down the domestic law at home 
and leading the way to the chase and four. The chase and four is a kind of carriage, Mata. So these are the duties of the lady of the house. Anything of honor, she has to lead. She has to uh, manage the servants. She has to guide her guests into and out of her house. And walking immediately after Lady Russell out of all the drawing rooms and dining rooms in the country. So. Even outside of her house, when she goes to social events, nobles enter and exit in order of rank. And the most important person goes first, and then the least important noble goes last. And Lady Russell is about the same. Uh, we'll, we'll read later that she's slightly lower in rank than Sir Walter. So she's about the same rank as Elizabeth. But Elizabeth is a daughter and unmarried, so she's slightly behind Lady Russell. Therefore, she walks immediately after Lady Russell out of all the a drawing room is a living room, cutting and dining rooms in the country at every social event. 13 winters revolving frosts had seen her opening every ball of credit which a scanty neighborhood afforded. A ball is a dance. Of credit means that it's a good party. It was done well. It has value. Uh, and a scanty neighborhood. Scanty means it has few uh, things of value. Here it means it has few nobles. So there are not many nobles in Somerset. So of the few nobles and the few parties uh, or the few balls, all of the important ones and the good ones were hosted by Elizabeth. And 13 springs shone their blossoms, shown. This is show, Shen. It used to in, in in UK English it used to be spelled with an E. Today we spell it with an O. Uh, so for 13 springs, their blossoms as she traveled up to London with her father for a few weeks annual enjoyment of the great world. So every winter she hosts a good ball. Every spring she goes to London with her father to interact with the wider world, not just Somerset. She had the remembrance of all this, so re she remembers all of this of her life. She had the consciousness of being nine and twenty, twenty nine. To give her some regrets and some apprehensions. Uh, so she's worried that she might be growing too old for marriage. She was fully satisfied of being still quite as handsome as ever, but she felt her approach to the years of danger, danger of not being able to be married, and would have rejoiced to be certain of being properly solicited, proposed to, by baronet blood within the next 12 months or so or two. So if a proper noble started to pursue her in marriage, within the next year or two, she would be much happier. Uh, she had had one disappointment, and this disappointment was precisely the heir presumptive, the very Walter, William Walter Elliot Esquire. And so the following paragraphs tell the story of how Sir Walter once tried to get Elizabeth married to William Walter. But the young man wanted to have nothing to do with their family and very rudely rejected them. And therefore Elizabeth is now still single. And you might be thinking, wait, isn't that young man a cousin? Aren't they family? The answer is he's far enough away that it's OK for them to be married. 
And the reason Sir Walter wanted Elizabeth to marry him is because again, after Sir Walter dies, he, the young man becomes the next baronet. And so Elizabeth would continue to be a noble. So the question is still the question of status. Let's stop here. Do you have questions? OK, uh, please read before next week chapters five to eight. Um, yes. Uh, 